Good morning, everybody. Let me pray at the beginning. We pray that as we look at your word, you will speak to all of us this morning, equipping us for your service. Amen. Well, good morning. And on Father's Day, um, my father was a great role model. And I often think of him, even though he died more, nearly 30 years ago, um, I still find myself using some of his characteristics and I look in the mirror in the morning and think, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> <laughs> so my title this week is, How Should We Live? Uh, in two parts, first in a Christian community and secondly, in an environment increasingly hostile to Christianity. As we'll see, if we feel apprehensive about the second part, the uh, hostile environment, we may need to make sure that we're doing the first part correctly. If we're seen as behaving badly, then the hostility is justified. And I don't need to list recent examples of bad behaviors by people ostensibly of faith. They've done a huge amount of reputational damage and we need to work hard as a church and as individuals to repair this. However, let's not dwell on that today. <clears throat> Following on from last week, remember Jack uh, preached very much on the first part of this chapter that there was a cost to following Jesus. So the two things mean prepared to make sacrifices uh, described as being a reasonable or logical service, the service. And secondly, in verse 2, having a whole new mindset. Uh, we'll be looking at verses 9 to 21 today. But before we do that, let's go back to verse 2 and just have a look at it. So if you've got your Bibles handy or your devices, uh, have a look at Romans chapter 12. And we'll look at... Um, various bits in detail. <clears throat> so verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's a caterpillar undergoing metamorphosis into a butterfly. And the Greek word for transformation in verse 2 is closely related to metamorphosis. The butterfly looks very little like the caterpillar. The caterpillar's got all these little legs, but the um, butterfly only has six legs, as far as I recall, and a couple of antennae and beautiful wings, which, of course, the caterpillar doesn't have. And this is the kind of change that we are encouraged by Paul to undergo. And rather than slavishly following the latest fashions, as you see on the right-hand side. Just to fit in, we should be aiming to be Christ-like. <clears throat> when we feel increasingly out of tune with non-Christians, we are tempted to just go with the flow. And of course, the latest trends or memes are not necessarily in conflict with the ways Christians should behave. But increasingly, Christians are coming in for difficulties because of the prevailing um, uh, uh, the, way, the way things are and coming in for ridicule or outright hostility. In fact, just being here on a Sunday morning makes us potential targets. Let me read you a quote. Oh, it's on the screen, in fact, but you may not be able to see it too well from the back. According to the U.S. Family Research Council report, 69 acts of hostility against churches in 29 United States states have already occurred during the first quarter of the year, and that's just this year, including 53 acts of vandalism, 10 arson attacks or attempts, three gun-related incidents, three bomb threats, and two other incidents such as assault. The statistics represent approximately three times the number of hostile acts that, that 
um, this have occurred this year compared to the same time frame last year. <clears throat> so this quote emphasizes an increase in hostile acts against churches. Christian leaders too are targets, as you will see from this piece from the Guardian newspaper, um, and it's referring to the UK. Off-duty vicars are urged to forego dog collars for safety's sake. Vicars are being advised to stop wearing dog collars when not working to make themselves less vulnerable to attack. National Church Watch, an independent group that advises clergy of all denominations on security, said priests were often targeted because they were considered unlikely to fight back. Clergy used to wear dog collars all the time. Uh, now they only do it for weddings and funerals or other special occasions. Over my lifetime, I'm approaching the great 8-0, I've got to say, I've seen huge changes in attitudes of people of the cloth. In the town where I grew up, the vicar was universally revered, uh, was regularly called upon to perform civic duties, and it was a special honor to have him, it was always a him, uh, come to tea. The local bishop would turn up once a year in a chauffeur-driven Rolls Royce, and in his gaiters, the <laughs> riding breeches, that's how it was. At his approach, people would tremble. Well, all that has changed. Christian bashing in the media is now what is termed de rigueur, or required by fashion. So what should our response to an increasingly hostile world be? Well, let's try to understand it first of all. Someone has written, a secularism increases People just understand religion less and less. They have less of the respect for religion that they might have had decades ago. There's a conflict between Christianity and secular dogmas, some of them rooted in the sexual revolution. The writer goes on, all of these are increasingly in conflict with core Christian teachings and core Christian beliefs. So some sectors are getting increasingly intolerant of Christianity for this reason. And the writer thinks that we're seeing, we're seeing that even being represented physically with these physical attacks on churches. So what do we do? Well, we can retreat into bunkers and batten down the hatches. We can hanker back to earlier times when Sunday schools were bursting at the seams and people had to come early for services in order to find a seat. Remember that, some of you? If only we could get back to the good old days is what people, especially of my generation, may say. But today's reading from Exodus reminds us that God is the God of the present and not of the past. God spoke from the burning bush saying, I am, not I was. And Jesus made the same point. God is the God not of the dead, but of the living, referring to the same passage. Not the God of the 1950s, but of the 2020s. God understands what we're up against. In some ways, it's not too different from how it was in Rome at the time Paul was writing. Remember the Emperor Nero? Remember the lions in the Colosseum? Hopefully it won't come to that in Australia, but let's not forget that in some countries right now, Christians are being tortured and killed for refusing to give up their faith. But let's not get a bad reputation here in Australia and here in Warrigal for our poor behavior. Paul is issuing very practical advice in this chapter. If you do the things he mentions here, there will be no justification for hostility. People who mistreat you are then in direct danger of God's justified wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, which is in verse 19. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look carefully at the list of how we should behave in verses 9 to 18. Here, they are, here I've summarized them on this slide. 
<clears throat> so be sincere in love, cling to good, hate evil, honor each other with familial or brotherly affection, be, in, be enthusiastic or zealous, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, be generous, turn the other cheek, be empathetic both in celebration and commiseration, don't be haughty, don't despise the lowly, Seek to do what is considered right and try to live peaceably with everyone. But we perhaps do these things, but some are more difficult than others. Let's just consider this list for a bit. And if you could mentally just list the top one or two things that you find the most challenging. I'll pause while you do that for a second. So maybe it's turning the other cheek or blessing rather than cursing our persecutors or even being enthusiastic or fervent does not come naturally to us. But don't forget, we have the Holy Spirit of Christ on our side. He is the indwelling advocate, helper and, in, and internal flame. Let's tap into this sublime gift to the church on a much more regular basis. So it's so easy to forget to do that. Although some of these qualities are what you would normally want to see happen in our Christian communities, uh, like familial affection and celebrating and commiserating and so on, many are more applicable to how we treat people generally in the general society around us, our neighbours, our friends, uh, people we meet at our sporting clubs and so on. So with generosity, not haughtily, peaceably, not, and doing what is considered right. But there's a phrase I've missed out, and that deserves special attention. I think the batteries, oh, there we go. <laughs> so verse 17 starts with, do not repay evil anyone evil for evil. The natural response when somebody does something bad to us is to retaliate, to give as good as we got, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus tells us that is not the principle under his, lordish, under his lordship. But I, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's in Matthew 5, 44. Jesus reminded his hearers that there's no virtue in loving those who love us. Even the tax collectors can manage to do that. Loving our enemies is a particular Christian virtue. And Paul has more to say about this in the last three verses of the chapter. And the final verse in particular sums up the whole principle. Don't let evil overcome you. On the, on the contrary, use good to overcome evil. So don't let evil overcome you. Instead, overcome evil by doing good. No need to retaliate. God is on our side and can conquer evil. Paul introduces two Old Testament quotes. The first is Deuteronomy 32. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. And here it is verbatim in verse 19. God is the ultimate judge and he is the dispenser of justice. But verse 20 goes further and is a quotation from Pro Proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. So heaping burning coals is a strange phrase, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So rather than walk, just walking away from an aggressor, we're encouraged to do something good in return. Rather than wanting to see them suffer and to gloat if they suffer a downfall, we should attend to their plight if they get into a plight. Remember the parable of the man who, was, who fell upon thieves it was his natural enemy, the Samaritan, who ministered to his wounds. 
And let me quote an example from the United States Civil War. The Battle of Fredericksburg was a one-sided Civil War encounter that left thousands of Union troops dead or wounded after a failed attempt to overrun the Confederate Army. Wave after wave of Union soldiers were cut down as they tried in vain to smash through a stone wall that protected the Confederates. The ground was soon littered with the wounded, whose cries for help filled the air during lulls in the fighting. Those cries reached the ears of teenage Confederate soldier Richard Kirkland, who begged his general for permission to give water and aid to the injured. After the, after the general reluctantly agreed, Kirkland gathered several canteens of water and went over the wall. In full view of both sides, Kirkland gave water and comfort to the wounded soldiers. Firing from both sides stopped, and there was so, which was soon replaced by cheers and applause. However, hostilities resumed whenever Kirkland went back over the wall to get more supplies, but then stopped whenever he returned. The strange spectacle continued well into the night, with Kirkland reaching most of the wounded. So, ma so no matter how, mu how much we may regard people as enemies, you know, those who trespass against us, their welfare should be our concern, even if it's only water to drink. Now, what does it mean by heaping burning coals on his head? And it's a curious phase, phrase, and commentators don't seem to agree on its meaning. Some think that the feeling of embarrassment, shame, or remorse that might come from a pricking of conscience might produce a kind of a burning feeling in, in the face. And others think that because flaming coals are used to melt metals, that the hardness in a person's mind is somehow melted. Either way, the aggression is mollified. <clears throat> so let's just think about enemies or people that transgress against us a bit. Maybe we have taken a stand based on our Christian conviction, and this has raised the ire of others. Maybe people in our lives have caused us real hurt and that has left scars. As I've mentioned already, the natural desire is to see the others suffer for what they've done. And this, of course, is understandable. But we need God's help to back away and to trust that he will administer justice in his time. Verse 19 talks of leaving room for God's wrath. Now, God... No, sorry... Wrath is not a nice word, it's one that we associate with violent anger and ongoing ill feeling. But the Greek word is more to do with strong indignation. God feels extremely strongly about sin, he does not trivialize its gravity. In fact, it's a word associated with judgments of magistrates during Roman times. So wrath is a judgment from a magistrate. And in the present day, you often see footage or read transcripts of judges delivering verdicts to people who do serious crimes. They don't hold back on making it very clear to the guilty party how serious their crime has been and the consequences of their wrongdoing. And they use such descriptors as cowardly, lying and lacking remorse of the um, of the criminal. The judgment of God will be likewise exacting, but will be all-encompassing. Only by pleading Christ's atoning sacrifice can we escape the penalty for these fair judgments. Outside of Christ, there is no escape. In closing, let's have a look at today's gospel reading briefly. Jesus predicts his suffering and death but also his being raised from the dead. Peter, in his characteristically impetuous way, takes Jesus aside and says, this is never going to happen. Jesus firmly responds that in him, in Christ, in earthly death there is eternal life, but apart from him, earthly life will only lead to death. 
So in him, in earthly death, there is eternal life. But apart from him, eternal life, earthly life, will only lead to death. Right. But God is not just a righteous just, righteous judge. He's also a rich rewarder. Our deeds of mercy and grace will not go unnoticed in heaven, even though here on earth they may be hidden. It says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So there is a cost to discipleship, but that's not in vain. Part of that cost is being willing to go against the flow, but we need to make sure that our house here is in order. Remember, it's how we treat each other here in our church-going community that determines how we are viewed from outside. If we don't return evil for evil, we'll be more likely to be afforded respect. So let's take very seriously how Paul is advising us to live uh, by looking at these verses in the latter part of chapter 12 as applicable now as it was 2,000 years ago. Question, how should we live? Answer, be transformed, not conformed. Let me pray together. May we take our, Father, may we take our Lord's rebuke to Peter to heart May we have in mind the things of God rather than of people. Help us by your Holy Spirit to be transformed in mind so that we become a people of compassion and of graciousness, the people you would have us be. May our heart's desire be to honour and serve you despite the cost, knowing that it will not go unnoticed. We pray this in the name of our precious Saviour, Jesus our Lord. Amen.